thank you victor once again all yours um thank you Ayush, for the introduction and thank you for inviting me to this uh, seminar uh, so obviously i will be talking about uh, the work which um, has been done with a lot of people in collaboration with a lot of people you see their names on the slide i'll i'll come back to that in the end of the talk um, this work is very much inspired and builds on top of the recent successes of generative adversarial networks gans uh, which i'm sure uh, most of you have heard a lot about uh, it's like a big thing uh, in deep learning and machine learning these days. And GANs have been phenomenally successful in generating high resolution images recently. Uh, maybe the breakthrough paper arguably was the progressive growing of GANs from NVIDIA uh, that presented first high resolution results for faces and some other objects. Uh, Google presented their system. Uh, uh, big GAN, which can generate different classes with the same network, essentially conditioned on the class label. And uh, the progress is very swift. Maybe the hardest object of all for modeling cats are not yet conquered by GANs. The images are arguably not yet as perfect as uh, for some other objects, but I'm sure even cats will at some point be generated with very high fidelity. Um, and uh, the motivation for what I will be talking about today is uh, uh, the desire to build on the success of GANs uh, and to go beyond the generation of static images. Um, so GANs will have been very successful for static images, not only for generating them, but also for manipulating them. Uh, very briefly speaking, uh, given a GAN model, you can take a real image embedded in the, into the latent space of, uh, of the GAN model, do some sophisticated, uh, um, semantically meaningful uh, editing in that latent space, and then map it back to the image space and get some semantically edited images. There has been a number of flora works that do just that. Uh, so as such, GANs are not only tools for modeling the distribution of uh, natural images, but also a very useful tool for modifying them and for working with them. So uh, now the thing we'll be discussing today is how we can move beyond static images to some more complex objects while trying, trying to retain the high resolution, high quality results of GANs for static images. Uh, Specifically, I will be talking about two different systems uh, generating two quite different classes of objects. Um, um, the first class are videos, uh, and more specifically, specific class of videos, len uh, landscape time lapses. Um, and the second class would be 3D avatars. Uh, and uh, despite all the sort of dissimilarity of these two, domains, the methods behind them will be, uh, will be uh, quite similar as you will see. Uh, so hopefully I'll convince you that the pattern is quite generic and can be extended to other objects. Okay, um, so I think there are not so many of us right now, so I will be happy to take questions in the chat as we go. I probably will probably have time to, to discuss questions on the go. Um, okay, so let me start with the first task, uh, the task of landscape reenactment. Initially, uh, so our goal was to build any system, not necessarily built on top of GANs, like any system that would take static photographs and add some, like these ones, and add some meaningful motion, meaningful motion to these uh, static photographs. Uh, let me show the results that we achieve. Um, so this is what our system can do to these uh, videos uh, without any user interaction it can create videos like this. Uh, of course, we were not the first ones to um, address this uh, problem. Uh, 
previous approaches, the most successful at least, uh, have been based on the idea of warping. So you take the static image, then you do some meaningful warping to it, simulating, emulating local motions, and then you maybe do some post-processing. Of course, like warping and post-processing are both implemented with networks these days. And it works nice for small notions, but it doesn't work for sort of uh, longer motions over like longer time spans or motions when you, for example, want a cloud to pass through the entire sky from, from the left of the, of the image to the right of the image. Uh, typically, these approaches can do it uh, as well. Uh, so in working on this task, we uh, came up to this idea of extending uh, style GAN uh, uh, to, to address this problem. Essentially, we build a generative model for time-lapse landscape videos, and then we achieve this reenactment by doing inference in this gener generative model that is taking a static image, finding a sort of a latent representation for that static image, and uh, adding some motion, uh, again, using some latent space operations. Of course, I will uh, detail this um, in the next slides. Uh, obviously, we train from data. We are very much dependent on data, and data for this problem has its quirks. I mean, it's uh, 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 one thing is that you can um, get a, a quite large data set of uh, static images quite easily. You can example, go to any big uh, photo website that allows you to download images and crawl them, and we got 400,000 uh, of them uh, at high resolution. So getting static images is not, uh, is not a bottleneck. What is a bottleneck is getting videos. So uh, I think uh, the guys uh, Invent, invested quite a lot of effort in getting and uh, getting realistic and diverse uh, landscape videos uh, at at this medium resolution, and, and it's not easy. In the end, we uh, for the published version, I think we worked with uh, uh, less than thousand of them, and of course, uh, this thousand. Uh, I mean, if we were to train only from those uh, nine hundred videos, it won't capture all the diversity of landscapes. So obviously we need an architecture that can learn from both the image data set and the video data set, model the appearance based on the image data set and model the most typical motions based on video data set. Uh, what's more, uh, what complicates our life more is that those videos are at a very, very different uh, rate of change. These are time-lapse videos, but the, the time increment can vary very wildly across them. Um, maybe because of that, maybe because just of the complexity of the task, the initial attempts, um, like trying, for example, autoregressive models, convolutional recurrent neural networks of different kinds, uh, uh, all failed despite uh, a lot of effort invested into them. Uh, like the typical failure case would be that they uh, uh, the model either would uh, explode, diverge, or it will converge to some static uh, generation. So uh, given like the initial image, it will just be stuck either at this image or get stuck right as soon uh, as uh, the process uh, goes. Uh, so instead, as I said, we decided to go with, um, with style gun uh, approach and try to expand it for this kind of data. Uh, I will very briefly now discuss the style GAN model. So here we work with style GAN version one. one. This is not essential. I think we, uh, we got, and then we got similar results with style GAN B2, though they were not better for us for this particular application. Uh, anyway, so in style GAN uh, V1, uh, you have uh, uh, two parts of the model, uh, the convolutional part sort of can arguably call it the main part, which synthesizes the image, and it uh, consists of blocks that gradually starts with a small tensor, with small small uh, spatial dimension of four, of spatial size four by four, and lots and lots of channels, and then it gradually 
increases the spatial dimensions by uh, differential blob sampling and shrinks the number of channels. So there are these uh, blocks at subsequent convolutions, four by four, eight by eight, and uh, all the way up to high or medium resolution image like 512 by 512 in our case. Um, and uh, uh, the auxiliary part is just a big uh, MLP, uh, multilayer perception, which takes a, a normally distributed uh, high resolution, uh, normally distributed uh, uh, high dimensional uh, latent vector, like 512 dimensional uh, in the case of Stalgan V1, um, and transforming this uh, distribution into to some complex distribution through a chain of uh, uh, fully connected layers uh, that keep the same dimension and uh, nonlinearities. And then this transformed sort of style vector is used to reweigh and bias the channels in the main convolutional uh, sort of, uh, uh, pipeline through adaptive for instance normalizations, which means that we just uh, take these style, ve style uh, vectors, predict, uh, and then predict from the style vectors the, um, the biases and the multipliers for each of the um, uh, channels in this pipeline. Additionally, you have a second uh, source of uh, randomness in this architecture, which are noise maps. Um, so they are sampled from, I think, Gaussian distribution as well, and then they are reweighted according to the learnable weights, and then they are just added to these tensors in the main pipeline. And uh, their role in the original architecture is just to inject some randomness, for example, for faces in style gun, they were used to sort of determine what is like the exact sort of arrangement of your hair. In our architecture, they sort of played them and then played a more pronounced role, as you will see. So, but basically, you have two sources of two kinds of latent variables the main latent variable Z and uh, the additional sort of latent variables, uh, which here are denoted as noise, but they can convey some signal essentially. Okay, um, so this is uh, the idea behind uh, style GAN. Uh, and this is how we uh, extended this architecture. Um, so essentially what we've done is we've duplicated uh, the latent variables. Um, more precisely, we added a small dimensional vector uh, to uh, the latent variable Z and we duplicated sort of the noise maps. So whenever style again duplicated sort of one set of noise maps at each resolution, we, we, we um, uh, generated two sets of noise. And uh, the idea is that one uh, sort of, um, sort of the, the main part of Z and the first uh, set of uh, latent variables of noise latent variables correspond to uh, stationary signal, so they are there to model uh, uh, temporarily persistent things. Um, and the second set of variables, uh, uh, this set of variables, and uh, uh, the second, uh, the latent, uh, the second set of latent noise variables are, are used to model dynamics in the scene. Uh, to be more specific, what we're trying to achieve here is that if we take a set of uh, latent variables and we keep sort of the white part intact and we keep the second part, the shaded part, and we resample the shaded part, and what we will get are two frames which look like um, two frames from the same uh, video. So, uh, like, Spatial arrangement will stay the same, uh, but for example, clouds or reflections or waves can change. Uh, okay, so this is this is this is the idea. So by resampling the shaded latent variables, 
we can generate more and more frames from the same video. And by resampling uh, um, the white part, uh, sort of the first set of variables, we will get a different video. So this is uh, this is uh, uh, the idea, um, uh, and uh, uh, we train the model. Uh, this extended style gain model, and we train it with uh, now with two sets of uh, with two different discriminators. The first one is the unity discriminator, which predicts uh, as in common style gain, it just looks at uh, individual um, frames uh, and compare them to our image data set as uh, taken a viewed as a real distribution and. Uh, uh, so it cares about the realism of individual standalone frames. And the pairwise discriminator um, looks at pairs of images that our model synthesizes, which share the static latent variables, right? So, in each, so to generate the pair, we keep these uh, static latent variables intact. We resample the second set of variables, the dynamic variables. We get two pairs, we plug them into the pairwise discriminator and the goal of pairwise discriminator is to predict the consistency. Uh, we ideally we want the pairwise discriminator not to pay attention uh, to the realism. Uh, we want to keep this realism estimation task on the unity discriminator. Uh, so we want the pairwise discriminator to tell us if uh, uh, if uh, these two frames uh, look like uh, pairs of frames from our video dataset. Uh, now, we really want to, our pairwise discriminator, not to focus on the image content, just uh, on the individual image content, just on the consistency. Uh, and uh, one of the reasons we want to do that is because we have limited diversity of content in our video data set. Uh, so we don't want our pairwise discriminator to overfit to the content in our videos. Uh, so what we what really worked well and uh, really improved the quality uh, of generation is the idea that is to add uh, 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 to augment the set of fakes the set of fake pairs with uh, a real with uh, the content from our video data set uh, which is not spatially consistent specifically to generate these uh, pseudo fakes, we would take a frame from our video data set and we would take two crops, two different crops of that frame and say that this is, look, this is a, these are two crops and they don't correspond to, uh, to consistent pair of frames, right? Because they correspond to two different locations. So they're not spatially consistent. And we add this, a certain portion of these fakes to the fakes generated by our, uh, by our uh, system. And that helped in, uh, with the quality of uh, the generated videos. Okay. Uh, so our fake set is composed of the fakes generated by the video and a certain proportion, a proportion of fake pairs cropped from the same frame of our video data set. In this way, uh, the system sees uh, frames from our video data set on both sides. They, it sees them as reels when they're just two consistently located crops from two different time moments. And it sees the same videos on the fake side when, when there's are two different crops of the same video frame. And it cannot, it, it therefore doesn't overfit to the content of the particular video data set. This is the idea. Okay. So uh, we train this model. Uh, know that the model never sees like more than two, sort of two frames. It never we never show uh, uh, to the model like uh, a long sequence of frames that sort of distinguishes our model from previous models that use GANs uh, um, that use GANs for for videos. Uh, now, how do we sample uh, from this model? So our model still generates standalone standalone um, uh, 
frames. Um, so to sample, uh, what we do is we so first we sample the static variables, the white variables, then we sample the uh, uh, gray variables, the dynamic variables, uh, and then uh, to generate spatial motion, we just warp this, the dynamic variables with some set of predefined homographies. So we have just we generated a set of 12 homographies, each corresponding to, a, to, to one single uh, dimension. So we sort of fix the horizon roughly at the middle of the, uh, of, of, of the image. And then we sort of do warping of the clouds and the mirrored warping below the horizon. And we just have this predefined sets of homographies uh, and we just um, uh, have it pre-computed and we can apply each of this, any of these 12 homographies, which would apply warping to these gray variables. We tried some other models of motion. We tried to build in this warping into the learning. It didn't, didn't improve. So just, uh, so the model just has this natural bias that if we warp uh, the dynamic variables, uh, it, it creates motion. So let me now show you uh, 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 the samples from our model first at low resolution, at 256 resolution. I hope you can see videos on uh, Zoom. It's about to start playing. Uh, yeah, I think now it's playing on my computer. Could you please, Ayush, could you please confirm that you can see the motion in the chat? Uh, Uh -huh. I'm not sure how choppy it is on your side. On my side, it's 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 reasonably smooth. So you can see like, uh, so these are all, these are sort of dynamic scenes that don't exist. Uh, obviously you can see some, well, whenever it samples, try to sample some buildings, uh, you can see these are fakes and general landscapes uh, actually look reasonably realistic. Uh, okay, let me uh, go to the next slide. So the next slide is uh, uh, the same model, but at 512 by 512 resolution. And it still, still looks interesting, I think. Uh, so these are these samples are obtained by just warping, warping these temporal temporal variables. Uh, okay. Um, now uh, this allows us to generate samples uh, but uh, what we're really after is uh, reenacting real photographs in this case. Uh, so augmenting and modifying working with real photographs using GANs is a hot topic. Uh, as we were working on it, new and new works appeared that uh, discussed how real images can be embedded into GAN space. These are some uh, earlier links now, by now the list would be much longer. Uh, so basically there are two ideas. First, this is, uh, you can train an encoder. So again, you can, you can view GAN as a decoder, then you can train sort of a pairwise uh, pair to it, and an encoder which would take a real image and uh, embed it into GAN space such that the GAN would recover the original image if you plug it, if you plug in the corresponding latent variables. And then the second idea is optimization. You can, uh, um, sort of, you can take the latent variables and you can try uh, to modify them using gradient-based method to fit the real image that you have, traversing the, the GAN space. Uh, at the time that we started, uh, methods were not working perfectly, so we, uh, we had to try lots of things, lots of hacks, and in this particular case, things and hacks were really important because the better, 
the inference became the better became the result. Uh, so it was really not like just simplest inference would give us the result straight away. We really need to work on the inversion. Uh, part of the reason is that our model is uh, sort of doubly over parameterized. So in normal GAN, you would have uh, some variables here and some noise maps here. Okay, so if you uh, so you already have more variables than you have pixels. So uh, uh, your inverse problem is a sort of ill posed. There are multiple configurations of latent variables which produce the same image. Uh, we have sort of doubled the set of noise of noise maps, so we have even more ill posed problem. So uh, it is important to what kind of biases does our inference procedure instill in the system. It, uh, it, it affects the results by a lot. Uh, so in the end, this is our, I will now describe our inference approach. Uh, so we use a pre-trained encoder uh, that uh, trains a generator uh, on synthetic data. So we generate lots and lots of samples from our model. And then we train a network which takes the sample and try to predict the latent variable that generated that sample. And we're trying, as some other work, we're trying to predict not the, not the variables Z because it's very hard, but the variables W from the image content. Okay, uh, so it, when we need to embed an, an image, we would uh, take the result of the encoder and then we start optimizing from this result of the encoder. So we optimize using, uh, uh, I think, Adam uh, trying to modifying a W so that we are trying to fit uh, the target image that we need to embed. And at this point, we already optimize over uh, Ws and over the noise maps, which, which are initialized by some random values. Uh, so we impose some regularizations. For example, we don't want our W to deviate too much from the initial guess. And by the way, similar to some other parallel works, we optimize not in the W space, but in the extended W space, which has the separate style for each uh, for each uh, scale uh, to, to, to increase the flexibility of, of, of the model. Okay, so we optimize uh, and we still don't get the perfect fit uh, to the image, or at least we don't want to get perfect fit because uh, that would require to leak a lot of signal into the noise maps, which would not result in good animation. So, because of that, we do it for a fixed number of iterations, then we freeze the obtained W vector and the noise maps, and then we fine tune the parameters of the generator to achieve the perfect fit uh, to the image that we're trying to embed. Uh, so here is, uh, uh, and then once we embed uh, the image, we can then start warping the dynamic, the dynamic uh, variables here to achieve the motion. Okay, so here is the illustration. Uh, uh, so in the top row, you see what happens uh, when we're given this image, we only use our encoder. So the encoder returns image like this, which is animated, could be animated reasonably well. So you see like the clouds are nicely flowing, but this image is very different from the input image, from the image that we're trying to uh, reenact. In the middle row, you see the output of uh, uh, the case when we do the optimization of W and noise maps. Uh, so again, with proper uh, regularization, we get a uh, reasonably good uh, uh, fit and we get nice animation, but the fit is not perfect. So there are some differences here. There are differences in the, is a difference in the arrangement of leaves. Actually, this image is probably here where it's behaving better than in some other images, but you can also see that the cloud is, clouds are a bit blurry, not exactly matching the clouds here. 
So because of that, when we fine tune the generator, the fit improves and now the fit is actually quite a bit better. And in some images, the, the improvement is even, even bigger than here and we can still get nice motion. Okay, so in this way we... Victor, may I ask one question? So the motion, the motion is here. Sorry, uh, what was the question? Yeah. Uh, uh, suppose on the left side, you there's a water where you see reflection of the clouds as well. Yeah, so the reflections, okay, we have this sort of, uh, um, so the reflections are not always working well, uh, but in some cases, as you will see, they will be doing, they will be moving okay. Uh, so uh, the way we handle them is that we say that the horizon is roughly in the middle and then we sort of mirror the homography applied to the top half of the image and to the bottom uh, half of the image. And that so gives us a reasonably good reflections. Don't you think that if I have a very short video, let's say, uh, will that enable me to implicitly learn about reflection as well? Uh, probably, yes, uh, but not from the limited set of videos that we have. Uh, I so uh, I think it's a lot, a lot of things are bottlenecked by the limited data set of videos. I see. Uh, so these are inference results that uh, sort of medium resolution, I think at 512. Here you see like something's happening with, with the reflections. Uh, so they're, they're, they are moving, uh, maybe not perfectly, but reasonably. Uh, um, okay, and uh, so these are sort of short range motions. There are also sort of long range changes like changes of lighting, like change of time of the day. And they are present in our training data set and uh, our model learns to control them using these variables, this sort of allocated part. Actually, it's, it's well, for spatial part, we sort of duplicate them. Here it's very much imbalanced. So we have sort of 509 dimensions uh, for static effects here and just three variables for dynamic change and three is just enough giving it more dimensions doesn't help um, and uh, so we achieve a change of time of the day by modifying these variables uh, for real images we don't try to invert w to infer z from w that happened to be a very hard problem uh, we couldn't we couldn't train an invert network it didn't work so instead we train a sort of a forward network which takes as an input the current W and the desired dynamic uh, Z that we want to get. Uh, and it and predict gives us, predicts us the update to, to the W that we need to make to move us uh, towards a certain value of these uh, dynamic Z variables. Uh, I hope I, I, I uh, okay, I'm not too confused. That doesn't sound too confusing here. So the idea is not, not to invert this part of the network, but instead to predict the updates to W directly, given the desired change uh, in, in, uh, in, the, in this, in this like short part of set variables. So then we get uh, these kind of changes for, for um, sort of longer, longer range. Oh, Victor, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, one, one more question. Uh, yeah. From the animation perspective, you have shown amazing results with the cloud movement. But can we also animate like the sun position, like making sunrise or making sunset? Uh, no, we cannot do that. Uh, uh, it's yeah, it's a very good question. So uh, at least our model, uh, our model. Uh, was not able to learn that. For that, it would need to sort of learn to model uh, the sun in these Z variables, and maybe our model does not have a proper sort of inductive bias for that. I see. Um, okay, let me maybe show you more results, which I think are representative of what our model can and cannot do. Uh, so here you see, for example, some failure cases. Uh, so whenever we have tall buildings, 
it doesn't always handle them gracefully. Uh, uh, but generally, for more like wild, uh, uh, non-human made, uh, man -made scenes, it works better. Uh, these are more results. Uh, then we have an upsampling scheme, which is a bit sort of heuristic, maybe not so pertinent to my today's topic. So just given a data set of very high resolution static images, uh, we can sort of do additional upsampling and give get the results uh, like this at 2K resolution, for example. Um, uh, okay. This is 2K uh, resolution generated from uh, what? What is the input resolution? Uh, yeah, for from 2K images. So the, 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 these are not samples; these are animations of real of, of real photographs. I see. I see. Um, okay, and maybe the last bit for this part is the animation for out of domain samples, paintings, photographs, like, so it worked for black and white photography out of, out of the box. Uh, it worked for some painting, for, actually for most paintings out of the box. Uh, especially like this example of very old photograph by Prokudin Gorsky who photographed Russian empire before the first world war, completely world which is completely gone. Uh, captured in, in color photography, which is you know, a very unique technology at that time, uh, and uh, adding motion to that gives a very interesting effect, I think. Okay, um, so this is the first part. Now uh, I have uh, some time for the second part, which is quite different. Here we are motivated by the telepresence task which obviously is a very big, uh, very, very big thing uh, like in, in your lab. And uh, um, um, we're also very much interested in this topic. The grand goal is to have uh, telepresence like in Star Wars. And uh, the promising approach, maybe the most promising approach for that are avatars, which are sort of 3D entities animated by, you know, in a parametric way using pose parameters. Right? Very loosely speaking, so we do some. We build some uh, models which can be controlled by, by the pose. Uh, and ideally, we want uh, we want to you know to build these uh, models with as high realism as possible, but also from as little data as possible. Maybe from a single image that would be ideal. We don't achieve that. I will show some results from single image. They're not great. Uh, but I think the generative modeling uh, might be an interesting path towards this goal. Uh, so uh, we built our approach here based on you know, very strong components. We use a parametric body uh, model, simplex from Michael Black's lab. Uh, we could have taken uh, uh, others like the CMU model, uh, and uh, you know it models very well the naked body. Uh, it doesn't model clothing or hair. Modeling clothing or hair is now a very active and hot research uh, topic. There are many new papers, but I think it's still fair to say that we can model sort of the naked body much, much better than closed body with hair. Uh, so to add uh, realism when we have an imperfect proxy, uh, so the popular approach now is to use neural rendering. I think this work from uh, 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 Nissner's lab is uh, an excellent one showed that using a relatively coarse proxy, you can model, uh, you can get quite realistic renderings using neural rendering. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, in the original paper, they showed uh, that they can use this approach to model sort of heads, 
we ex essentially we expand it to full body and then add generative modeling on top. Uh, so uh, here is how it works for uh, sort of here's how it works, how we combine the two, the two things. Uh, we take uh, to model in our term, we sort of create a neural texture, uh, which is a 16 dimensional image. Uh, we sort of superimpose this texture on the parametric body model uh, using uh, some rasterizer. It does not, so we don't use the back propagating we don't use back propagation into the mesh parameters, so we can use a simple rasterizer like OpenGL. So it's the, it needs not to be a differentiable range rank essentially. We don't want really need to back prop into the texture. And then we sort of we have a rendering network which translates this kind of image, 16 channel image, into a color image. Okay, and then we have a different pose with the same texture. Uh, then we sort of render and gives you a different pose of the same person. Obviously, uh, what we can do as in the original, as was suggested in the original deferred neural rendering approach, we can feed the texture using gradient descent. That is, we can take a video of a person, segment the video, fit simplex uh, models to each frame, and then we sort of uh, use back propagation to update the renderer parameters and the differentiable texture in order to feed uh, the outputs of the network to the ground truth. Okay, so we just take the you know, perceptual adversarial losses between feature matching losses between these two, back probe those losses, update the rendering parameters and the texture parameters. Uh, and give, we have a video of that person, we can do that and we obtain uh, interesting, uh, imperfect, but quite good models uh, from uh, not, not very long videos. Okay, so these are, these are examples. So here's a person with a relatively tight clothing, uh, but we can also do that for a person with quite loose clothing and uh, long hair. Uh, so these are two avatars animated by the motion of actually of a different person and captured with Kinect. So yes, sort of loose clothing is a bit blurry, but still it's sort of it's generated reasonably well. But these two avatars were obtained from, from the video data. Okay. Uh, yeah, just to be clear, so this, so this are, uh, our model predicts the RGB and the mask, so we can superimpose this uh, onto onto the background and get sort of this our, these avatars into sort of the augmented reality. Okay, uh, uh, now let's bring in the generative modeling. Uh, we will now build a model for these neural textures. So we'll now take style GAN. In this case, we used style GAN V2 a generator, and we'll uh, train this style GAN together with uh, the renderer uh, and uh, with this rasterizer in the middle. So build a generative model of neural textures and train it end to end with this pipeline. So our discriminator will be looking at these renderings and tell us whether they are real or fake and how should we modify them to make them more real and we'll back prop all the way to, to the style gun. And uh, uh, so we train it on a data set uh, of segmented, uh, segmented bodies to which we fit uh, simplex meshes. Uh, Obviously, this is not enough because this scheme of, uh, uh, of training does not guarantee us temporal persistence. That you know, the uh, same texture superimposed on two different poses would give us the same person. So we add a bring in a pairwise discriminator which looks at two different images generated from two different poses and tell us whether they look like. Uh, uh, images of the same person. So we now we need to train again on videos, on data set of videos from which we sample pairs of frames. 
and we show them. Uh, so our uh, unary discriminator discriminates images and our parallel discriminator tells between uh, real pairs sampled from the same video and fake pairs generated by taking the same texture and super superimposing by uh, the same body in two different poses. Okay. And again, we want to focus our pairwise discriminator not on the realism, but on the consistency. So here, it helps slightly uh, if we uh, modify, if we augment the fake pairs set with uh, sort of real pairs, which are sampled from two different videos of two different people. This is not as efficient in the, as in the uh, first example, because there the process sort of is more meaningful but it still helps and gives you additional quality if you sample real pairs uh, from, two, from two different videos and sort of they both look realistic uh, and therefore sort of pairwise discriminators focuses a little bit less on the realism and focuses a bit more on the consistency and the realism is mostly assessed by the unit discriminator. Okay, uh, so this is the scheme, this is how um, uh, we train. Now we need a data set of videos. Again, it didn't, it's not so easy to get one. Uh, what we scrapped, uh, what we got uh, is we scrapped uh, TEDx videos uh, from YouTube. They are quite diverse. They are like very diverse demographics, which is good, but it, they are sort of, of limited resolution. Many videos give you people of, Quite low resolution, there are crops, truncations, there are inevitable segmentation errors, there are like limited viewpoint variability, and lighting is also very specific. This scene stage lighting, uh, there, are, there are some blue lights which are not very natural. So, this data set is not very perfect. You see the set of representative samples from this data set. Based on this data set, we get the results like this. I'm now showing the samples uh, from from uh, from this data set. They are non-cherry picked. Uh, they are superimposed uh, uh, so the, on the same, so the top row is superimposed on the, on the same sort of uh, average uh, sort of mean uh, female uh, uh, body mesh and then mean male body mesh. The only cherry picking that I have made here is that I for each sort of uh, texture I picked, which, whether it looks more like male or female texture. So that's the only chart picking happening here. Otherwise, these are representative samples. Uh, so they're not like super realistic, but they're not that much worse than uh, the original TEDx samples. We're now throwing other data set into the learning and we expect that the quality will, will improve quite a bit. Um, I can also show some, some rotations. Again, in TEDx, you rarely see people from the back and sometimes backs are litted, are either unlit or lit with some blue lighting. So these rotations do, don't, don't look perfect. I think part of the problems will go away if we move to a more appropriate data set for this task. Uh, so these are samples and now to create avatars for real people, we, again, we need to do inference. Uh, uh, so we do, I will now sort of go very briefly, again, we do inference by training some encoder and then doing optimization. We didn't spend that much time uh, on fine tuning the inference procedure here. I think there should be still some gains began by improving the inference procedure. But anyway, so given an image, we try to improve W a vector, uh, and then we fix W and fine tune the uh, sort of uh, generator parameter, and then we are, end up with uh, the neural texture that we use in the rasterize and the renderer, and then we can sort of get a neural avatar. So given the texture, given the body, SMPL simplex body parameters, we can now render this avatar fitted to a single image or to a few images in new poses from new viewpoints. This is the idea. So I will now show 
some uh, results for hold out uh, data. So this is, these are the results obtained from a single image, uh, just the image that you see here. Again, it made some reasonably reasonable guess how the back can look like. I think the guess could have been better. Again, we'll see if we replace that X with a different set, which more uniformly sort of sampling the viewpoints. Uh, for example, now we have the Humbi data set, which I think is very suitable for that. Hopefully the result for the back in this case will be good. Uh, if, we get, uh, our if we try to make avatars based on eight images, uh, so they, they look better, at least from the back. We still have some segmentation consistencies, which are, I think we need to fix, but I think we'll fix that. Uh, and uh, currently, so this is, these results are at 256 by 256 resolution, which is not enough, obviously. So we will, we're going to, we're already looking at high resolution images by 512 and potentially more. Okay, and this is, uh, this is, this is one more example. Uh, And this is based on eight different photographs. Okay, so this brings me uh, to the conclusion. Uh, so I, I think I've shown you like a general pattern how GANs can be expanded, extended to more complex objects than static images. So in this extension, pairwise discriminator plays uh, the key role. Um, and uh, I think one interesting challenge, which here we solved sort of in the problem specific way, maybe there, is, there could be some consistent approach is how to decouple the roles of the pairwise discriminator and uh, um, the unary discriminator, how to force the unary discriminator to pay attention on the quality and pairwise on the consistency. I think this is an open, open question and we see the, the immediate benefit uh, when you make progress uh, in, in this sort of, um, in this uh, uh, direction. Uh, I hope uh, uh, there could be other results obtained with this particular scheme and uh, GANs obviously have a very bright future for all kinds of data, all kinds of visual data, not only for static images. So this is the conclusion. I will uh, leave you with the, uh, with the real examples, uh, with the real photographs of the uh, authors of this work who actually have done uh, uh, the actual work uh, for these approaches. Uh, thank you, I think we'll still have three minutes if, we have, if you have some questions. Yeah, thank you, Victor. Uh, are there questions? People can unmute themselves. Uh, I can start with my mind question first and people can also unmute meanwhile. Uh, uh, with, with two versions. One is when you're using style can B2 for uh, body, uh, for training the model for the full body, right? Uh, the simplex model, and then you are doing the neural retraining part. Are you training it from scratch or are you fine tuning the model? Uh, with style again, so we tried to warm the renderer uh, with. Uh, uh, by training a set of models, but I think it, it, it then it didn't it wasn't necessary. So basically, we train from scratch. I see. Uh, yeah, we can we can train from scratch. Yes. The the other question I have is this contrasting three D body face models, three uh, D body models vs the face facial outputs. Now now you are in the space of both. You have amazing results on the faces as well, and you have amazing result on the three D bodies body also, right? The the last part which you showed for neural rendering. Now, one thing is, uh, there is still a disjunction between face and the body of models. By that, I mean, let's say if I just give you 3D model and if I have to look at the details of the face, the details on the face are totally gone there. Uh, whereas if you think yeah. from 
more of a, a natural teleportation perspective i should be able to go back go in front be able to look at the avatar like i'm just interacting over there it's like it's a it's a real world setup that if i just go behind i see the body but if i come close to the person i should be able to see the details of the person yeah yeah sure i mean uh obviously you can improve things by uh, showing the discriminator uh, the crops uh and you can train or you can throw in a, a head data set into the learning and that's what we plan to do uh i cannot tell you yet how much does it help we, we, we it is definitely in, definitely in the plan but generally having good geometric proxy is yeah. in the face area should, should help yeah uh, that the other thing victor which i noted in in your work uh, this was uh, for the few short facial retargeting and for the the body retargeting also uh, you seem to be using let's say information such as key points uh, or say simplex model is there some way we can get rid of the intermediates and be able to do things directly in the image space uh so we try i mean uh, uh, i mean i originally like a couple of years ago we were tried to do we tried to use less to the flesh geometric proxy just to use skeletons as the only proxy essentially uh but in the end having good good proxy good geometric proxy really helps that was sort of the conclusion. So I think improving geometric models. So uh, arguably, but maybe maybe we're not here. So the argument here is that we can do bodies, naked bodies reasonably well. So let's use parametric model for bodies. And we cannot, we cannot yet at least do clothing and hair well. So let's yeah. leave it to neural rendering. That's, yeah. that's, that's the idea. Yeah. So the reason why I was asking is uh, we have spent like 25, 30 years last, let's say, uh, in the vision graphics community to develop the parametric models or say the facial uh, key points and all stuff. But there are many, many categories where we don't really have good knowledge of what should be the key points. And uh, there we cannot use um, the, the 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 things that we are developing so if i'm just thinking out loud i don't have a good answer myself even uh if there was some way where we can get rid of some intermediates which is being defined by us but rather rely on the pixel information directly and have a latent latent function which which tells okay given this kind of data stream these are the things that should be where my uh, model should be dependent on uh help me do all sorts of things that we are doing right now using the parametric models or using the human defined models like simple simplex uh so i'm i'm, uh, I'm sure i understood the question uh or so yeah, yeah i mean simplex uh, or like uh, frank and adam these are like a really great great technology and I think it would be beneficial to keep them to keep them in the system uh, and maybe improve them further. Uh, and if, if people, if if a good, a really good generative, I mean, geometric model for clothing emerges, then I think the ideal system should have the model in, in inside it. Oh, yeah. Neural rendering, neural rendering bridges bridges uh, can do reasonably well but you cannot model that well uh, yeah, I, I think this so this this emerges as a common is a very common topic nowadays so, 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 so what i'm saying is like beyond humans can we go beyond humans uh, if, if we if we start thinking beyond let's say simple simple x uh, well obviously the first part the landscapes is is almost the opposite right so landscapes are yeah. very unstructured very unstructured so uh some things uh, i mean in some sense doing something very unstructured is easy uh maybe it's the bias of our data set but generally 
uh, the best results are the results without buildings, for example, when we start generating buildings, you could see some artifacts. Maybe that's because there, there, there were not so many buildings in the data set. So it's, I uh, maybe I shouldn't rush the conclusions there. Um, I see, 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 I see. All right, I think, uh, I think there are some midterms that people are having. So people are mostly absent today, uh, but thank you, Victor, once again. Uh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you, thank you all. Uh, have a nice uh, 